Chapter 162, Training Partner. That is impossible, only I know the best mantra. Inel wasn't really able to believe that someone was better than him. All his life, he was known to be the best at mantra and could predict the moves of others. But now he saw that Ken was better at his mantra and there was something higher than that. How was this possible? Inel was incensed and proceeded to throw lightning at him. Ken just watched this narcissistic bitch cry as he did so. His whole worldview just got destroyed, which led to his mental collapse. Ken just let him vent his feelings around for a while, and finally Enel calmed down. Enel didn't want to believe him, but the way Ken made a joke out of him was what made him understand that Ken had probably spoken the truth. Ken beat him with his hands, which had never been possible before, and he continued to claim that he wasn't very good at it. There was no point in degrading oneself after beating the other guy. Calming down after a few minutes, Enel looked at him with emotionless eyes again, but this time there was hatred in him. He knew that if he really went after the friends of this guy, he really might lose everything. They didn't have to be enemies. What do you want? Enel asked. Now we are talking. Ken smiled. He hated Enel for sure for what he was going to do to Skypea, but it was still a future thing, and it hasn't happened yet. So he wanted to see if this guy could be salvaged from his cruel and god-complex self. Enel didn't speak more, and wanted to see what this guy from Blue Islands wanted. T wants you to beat the shit out of my friends, Ken said. What? His words completely astounded Enel. What did he mean? Well, you have heard of my friends and how fearless they are. You priests won't be able to hold a candle to them, as they know hockey just like me. But you are different. You have speed and lightning with you. You can inflict serious damage. Ken said. Enel was confused now. This guy had threatened to destroy his work if he went after his friends, and now he was suggesting the same thing. Of course, I don't want you to go after the girls or the cute animal. Go after the boys and beat them but not kill them. But be aware that our Captain 2 is immune to your lightning, and the only thing you can do is inflict damage upon him using heat from the lightning. Ken said. Enel had a question mark on his face as he didn't get it. Don't think too much, just go after the boys. Ken said it in simplified words. But why? Enel really wanted to know. It's because they don't have someone who could genuinely hurt them. They need a good partner in training and to understand how big the world is. You can be their wake-up call. Can't you teach them yourself? Enel was more confused. He was sure that Ken was better than him. Then why was he asking him? T can, but I am their partner, and they will never feel a sense of dread from me. I want them to fear somebody, and you are the perfect asshole for that. Just don't touch Mashira, Cricket, and Shoujo. They will die if you use your lightning on them. Ken said. Inel's eye twitched a bit when Ken called him an asshole, but he didn't protest. He didn't have the right to protest. T can do the favor if you teach me the other mantra. Inel was ready to be the training partner, but he didn't want to do it for free. Sure, do your work. Lead them to your temple. Also bring the Shandians and the Sky Island people to the main temple. It's time they bury the hatred that has been going on for so many years. Ken ordered. Enel wanted to say that he was a god and didn't take orders from others, but he stopped himself. He would only get beaten in return. He wanted to learn the other mantra and then take his revenge. He was ready to do his bidding only because of that reason. After Ken gave him directions on what to do, Enel became lightning and vanished. Ken himself went on his way around. He had been running around a lot since he came to this world. Training with Luffy and Ace, hunting for food always, take care of everything. It was only recently that, after getting on board the ship, he didn't have to care about the food, but then again, he would have to care about all the other things and keep everyone in line. He didn't have any complaints about it, and he was happy to be with the crew and was more excited to see the end of their journey. The only thing he complained inwardly about was the characters he got and what others got. He himself had the system, while Luffy got one of the most broken characters. He wished he had something like that. And it was for this reason that he was racing against time to realize the full potential of his character, Obito. He had already unlocked the Rinnegan abilities, and all he needed was to get the Menjekyo. After that, 
it would be easier for him. Now that he had free time, he would try to see what new abilities he would be able to unlock. The island was big, and he would be able to do anything he wanted. Thus, he roamed around, practicing whenever he wanted. Meanwhile, Luffy and the others got separated, and the two teams went through two different ordeals. NL didn't bother to alarm the priests that they were no match for the new guys. Thus, they suffered. In fact, the main force laid back and let the secondary team deal with the priests and the divine soldiers. Read 51 more chapters on my patreon.com slash the lighted ghost. Chapter 163, The Sheep is Being Fattened. Nami, Vivi, Chopper, and even Robin took up fighting and used their abilities the best they could. Vivi was well known for her analytical abilities, and thus, with her assistants Cricket, Shoujo, and Mashira actually wanted to be the men and help the woman, only to be beaten by the priests and the divine soldiers. It was the women who came forward and helped them, while the men just watched and cheered. Even Chopper was proud of himself as he changed to a whale in the last second and body slammed on a bunch of divine soldiers. The Shandias who were lurking around to take advantage of them were shuddering in fear when they saw Chopper turning into a gorilla, a bee, an elephant, a cheetah, and at the end, even a whale to take down the enemies. They silently moved away from them in order to inform Wiper, who asked them to take down the Blue Island guys. Even with their technology and numbers, they wouldn't be able to take these guys down. It would be death if they did so. Meanwhile, Nami and Visi showed their prowess. Nami had now almost mastered her full mastery of her airbending, and she was using it like crazy with her moves. Airbending and magic played together, and each move was devastating for the opponents. She didn't have hockey, but that didn't mean that she wasn't able to defend herself. Her airbending made it difficult for anyone to attack her, and anyone who came close would be blown away. Vivi was on another level. She took out freaking guns. This terrified everyone. Oi, Vivi, do you want to kill us too? Usopp was scared when he saw Vivi take assault rifles from her body. Don't worry, I will be careful, and I will only hit them in a non-lethal way. I have been practicing my aim recently. Vivi assured everyone, but not everyone was very convinced by her words. Hope others didn't get shred to pieces by the bullets, Robin said. Robin, don't say those scary words, Chopper shouted. But all in all, she did have fun with two assault guns in her hands. She shot everyone who came close. One could be fast, but that didn't mean that these priests had some kind of bulletproof speed, so even if they tried to dodge, the bullets tended to be faster. And it was a barrage of continuous bullets. This made the soldiers lose all heart and almost made them run. But what truly scared the living hell out of them was Robin. At first, she would use her devil fruit to hold her opponents down, but their bodies tended to be harder than the others, so she was finding it hard to just take people down using her devil fruit. And this is where she started using her power, writing different allegiances on some of the divine soldiers and making them their allies. This was like a living nightmare for others. This was the first day on the island as they moved around. Ken returned to one of the teams by evening. The two teams were still on separate missions and hadn't met up. Only one team came across one of the priests and he was badly beaten by Zoro, who used his full power on the priest. The priests didn't stand a chance. Yoriichi's character was in full bloom against the priest and it was almost a massacre. Enel still hadn't appeared as he waited for the other priest to go down. But he also noticed the other mantra that Ken had been using against him. This proved that the other guy wasn't lying. Actually, part of him wanted to run away after he was beaten down by Ken, but curiosity stopped him, and seeing the green-headed guy fight made him glad that he stayed and didn't run. It was sad that not everyone was around, but it was remedied soon as Ken opened the Bifrost and reached the other team. The priest was already taken care of, so one ordeal had already finished. They started a huge campfire, which the wolves joined later. Luffy and others danced along with the wolves, and they sang. Vivi had brought out a music player, so the vibe was perfect. Only Ken and Robin just sat and looked at the peaceful pirates. You don't celebrate? Robin asked. No, I don't like drinking, gee, and all the indulgence. Ken replied that he had a habit of wearing hats even in his earlier life and maintained it in this life too. 
He might eat a lot due to his bodily needs, but drinking and dancing were never his fort. Once in a while was fine, and that was all. Where did you go, by the way? Just like others, Robin too was curious about where Ken had been the whole day. Had some people to meet. Did you meet the Shandias? Ken didn't want to speak about what he did, and Robin didn't ask any more questions. Yes, Cricket spoke of a meeting between Calgara and Norland. This surprised them a bit, and they said they would come back. Robin said as she was still fascinated by history. That's good. By the way, there is a pantaglyph here. Ken suddenly said to Robin, What? Yes, I suppose the poneglyph is at a much higher altitude. You will eventually reach there. Ken said as he remembered Robin finding the petroglyph after the golden bell was brought down. Did you see it? Robin was excited, knowing that there was another one here. This crew was really his lucky star. Ken nodded. Hearing this, she couldn't wait to go and find the penoglyph the next day. After the huge celebration, they slept away due to exhaustion. Ken, too, didn't bother and went to sleep. He had a fun day, and these people would be in for a ride tomorrow. So they needed proper rest. Read 50 chapters ahead on my patreon.com slash the lightage host. Chapter 164, Suspicions. The next day, everyone woke up, and Ken again chose to be away from the group. The crew couldn't understand why Ken was so far away from the group, but they didn't stop him. And after an hour of his departure, NL finally showed up. Usopp, in order to prove his bravery, was the first one to go and face Enel, as he thought that this was some other priest. A few minutes ago, a round ball priest had appeared, and he was being played on by Sanji as he was kicked around like a huge football. Thus, Usopp got jealous and wanted to show his bravery to his friends. That was the first and greatest mistake Usopp had done since he had climbed the staircase that led to Mary. He stepped into the air and stood on the opposite side of Enel, and then he took out his bow and shot at Enel. It was there that they came to know that Enel was the one Ken had spoken about earlier and the one they felt kept an eye on them. The arrows went through his body as he elementalized himself. Usopp, Luffy had a very bad feeling about this, and he was right. Enel proceeded to pump in 500,000 volts on Usopp, and though he tried to dodge it, it was already too late. The huge electric discharge went through his body, and from there, he proceeded to fall on the ground. Sanji flew up and caught the unconscious Usopp and brought him down. Chopper ran to see if he was alive and was grateful that his heartbeat was fine. He was unconscious because his skin was burned to a crisp and the pain was too much for him. Zoro, Sanji, and Luffy got really angry at this. Never hurt their friends had been their crew's motto, and Enel did that in front of his crew. Luffy, Sanji, and Zoro all went into fighting mode. Zoro used his sun breathing while also coating his sword with armament hockey. The fire patterns on the sword lit up like the bright sun. Sanji had huge fire burning under his feet, and Luffy did hand signs and summoned ten clones. Normally, Luffy never liked summoning clones, as he felt it was an insult to his power. But here, he couldn't just let go of what happened. Though NL showed a straight face, his heart skipped a beat, seeing these men with such a huge aura looking at him with death-glare eyes. But he needed to keep his promise no matter what. And thus the epic brawl of 1v3 started. NL was pretty cunning in this fight. He didn't let his ego get the better of him. Ken had spoken about his lightning having no effect on Luffy, so he took the other route, and that was heat. Though Luffy could use fire and would be highly immune to it in the future, that didn't mean he was absolutely safe from heat, and Enel used that. He took out his golden spear and made it change its shape using electricity. Electricity actually worked as heat here and made the golden spear super hot. Enel was high up in the air floating, and only Sanji was able to fly. Sanji's style of flying wasn't the typical one, and he could only use his feet as thrusters. Thus, he could only use his feet for a few seconds before he could stop himself from tasting the grass. Thus, Zoro wasn't able to be that impressive in the fight and could only make his move when Luffy and Zoro gave him a boost. Luffy gave him a boost by making a huge pillar on which Zoro ran and delivered a strike at Enel, while Luffy did the same and jumped in the air to punch at Enel. He knew that using any kind of elemental ninjutsu on this guy was useless, as he was almost like a bolt of lightning, 
and only hockey could reign supreme. But here was the thing. NL2 had observation hockey, and it was not like Ken's, who had been training it for quite some time. And thus, even though these guys had armor, they would have to land the attack. And on top of that, Luffy, Zoro, and Sanji needed to avoid the lightning discharge and the huge spear of gold. Chopper and others were ready to help the three since they thought they were capable enough, but Robin stopped them. Robin, what are you doing? We can use our own powers against this long earlobe guy. Nami was a bit irritated. Yes, he can use my technology too to divert all the electricity being produced by this guy and drain him to the ground. Vivi said that was the way lightning was discharged in homes. Yes, we must help Luffy-kun. Cricket also beat his chest, just like Shoujo and Mashira. No, don't you think it's weird? Robin asked. What is weird? Chopper asked. The whole situation, Robin said. What do you mean? Vivi asked. Such a huge fight is going on, and Ken hasn't shown up. He is the best at manipulating lightning and would be the best to handle this god that had shown up. Robin reminded Ken that one of his primary powers was lightning, and he was known for keeping an eye on everything around him. But he hadn't shown up. This guy was probably the most powerful on the whole island, and Ken didn't bother to come to help his crew. This was very fishy. He must be held back for some other thing. Chopper didn't much of the absence of Ken. No, he has been away since yesterday. There must be a reason. Robin argued back. So what are you saying? He isn't helping us deliberately? Nami asked, as she could see what Robin was getting at. Yes, maybe he was the one who sent this guy to us. Robin as she spoke of her suspicions. Read 51 chapters ahead on my patreon.com slash the lighted coast. Chapter 165. No more Marimo. Robin, do you know what you are saying? You are accusing Ken that he had sent someone to kill us. How can you say that Robin after what he had done for us? Nami was infuriated and shouted while the three were busy battling Enel. Sanji in mid-air was almost burnt out by Enel, and at the last moment, Sanji somehow escaped the attack. He didn't realize, but the fire in his feet got blue for a split second, and that allowed him greater speed. Neither Sanji nor the people around felt it, but Ken, who was actively having fun time roasting a bird which he had caught to eat, noticed the sudden change in the percentage of Sanji's character completion. He could already hear the fight quite clearly in his ears and could tell what exactly was going on. Tino, this sounds absurd, and I know what he had done for us. I am not saying that he had sent this god guy to kill us. I am saying he had sent this god guy to make a fool of ourselves. Robin was adamant on her suspicions and spoke her mind. You mean he sent us to defeat us? But why will he do that? Vivi asked. Maybe because we have gotten too much arrogant. We have three godly characters among us, and just see how a single guy is making us an easy work of the three most powerful people of the ship, Robin said. Those words rang all the bells of everyone's mind. What Robin said was right. Being all-powerful had really made them feel invincible, but it took a single guy with Logia and Observation Hockey to show how far they were. Robin had witnessed the powers of the current admirals once, and she knew that they were the best of the best. At first the others thought that Robin might have been jealous or had some kind of enmity with Ken, but it had been some time and Ken still hadn't showed up. This made them realize that Robin's words might be true. Ken had always been the humble and grounded guy who always said that they were far from challenging the top, but these guys didn't take him that seriously after the lives they have lived. Well, except for Robin. The trauma of her childhood had made her fear many things out there and take every step after thinking twice. Meanwhile, there was finally a casualty of the fight, and that was Zoro. Zoro, who was stepped on Sanji's back and attacked Enel, had made an unsuccessful move, but Enel's counterattack was pretty successful. Zoro, you bastard, I will kill you. How dare you touch Marimo? Only I get to hit the green head. Zoro steadily fell to the ground and Chopper became a panda to cushion his fall. When Chopper changed back to see how Zoro was, he fell back in fear. Not because something bad had happened to Zoro, but the changed hair color of his. Zoro's green head had changed to yellow color. What? What is this? Chopper screamed. His scream stopped Luffy and Sanji too, who were in super angry mode and were going to attack Enel with all they had. 
They turned their heads and looked at Zoro, and they too, like Chopper, almost fell on the ground seeing his head. From the green moss head, Zoro just became a yellow mushroom head. Zenistu's affect had really got imprinted in him. What the hell is going on? Chopper, after getting scared of Zoro, he ran to him again and checked his vitals. His vitals, just like Usopp was fine, but the pain was too much for him to handle. It was good that the armament hockey had helped him lot and wasn't as hurt as Usopp was. How did this guy change his hair color? Did his brain get burnt? Robin asked. Robin, stop with your negativity. Chopper, how is he? Luffy asked as he came running in and asked. He is fine, just the hair color got changed. Chopper replied. To remember Zantisu's black hair color changed after he was hit by lightning. Did the same thing happen to him? Luffy asked. You mean one of the characters of Zoro? Did that really happen? Chopper asked. He had heard stories of the previous characters of his crew members, and none of them had any huge physical changes due to it. The only permanent physical changes he noticed were Luffy and Ace's eye. S. Ken's eyes two changes, but it's temporary. This time the victim was Zoro, and his whole identity just got changed with one attack. Forget about the straw hats. Even Enel didn't expect that this green head guy to change into yellow head guy. Though he was pretty impressed by the speed of the came, which gave off lightning as he ran, it wasn't enough for him to keep up with the real lightning. After seeing everything was fine, both Luffy and Sanji assaulted Enel with more power and vigor. Luffy now had let go of his smiling face and face Enel with utter seriousness. He wanted nothing more but to bring down this guy. He had various bruises and charred places on his body, and especially a black charred place on his left hand. Luffy almost never had a scar since the time he had self-inflicted the scar under his eye. But seeing the charred mark on his hand, one could easily say that this was going to leave a mark. Sanji was the only one who was able to evade attacks, but his attack too didn't have any effect on Enel. Sanji was almost heat-resistant now, in much degrees than Luffy, thanks to his bloodline and character. Summoning Jutsu. Out of nowhere, Luffy did summoning of Enma. Kid, it had been some time you called me. What's, what the, what is going on? Enma was happy to be called back, but seeing the destructions around made him realize that it was not a time to joke. Enma, transform yourself. I want to beat this guy. Read 50 more chapters on my patreon.com slash Chapter 166. The God Enma didn't argue with Luffy and turned himself into a long pole, which he caught in one hand. Luffy then proceeded to spin the pole in rapid speed while juggling in both of his hands. Over the years, Luffy had been learning to use his body as a weapon since he had the advantage of rubber, but since he had Enma, Ken had always forced him to use his pipe, which the four brothers always used as weapon when they lived in their island. Even Ken used a broken pipe and used to run around the streets in the city. The people in that garbage and even on the town used to fear the four brothers and avoided them at all costs. Later after Sabo left, the three brothers terrorized the town even more so and did so without any qualms. The wealthy people were so fed up with the three brothers that they appointed more people like Porchimi to get rid of them, and each of them would be beaten back by the three brothers with their pipe weapon. After Enma came to join them, Luffy started using him when he had to deal with people from far away, much further than his hands could reach. And thus he was equally good with the pole. Luffy proceeded to swing the pole at Enel. Enel didn't bother to dodge it, but this was where he committed another mistake. Enma didn't go through the body of Enel, but instead it hit him in his right abdomen. Luffy had hit him in a strong downward motion, and Enel was thrown to the ground. A crater formed on the place where he landed, and lightning dispersed around. Sanji, too, was furious with what this lightning guy did and proceeded to stomp at Enel while flying down from the air while accelerating. Luffy was able to coat Enma with hockey for a few seconds. He was still not so good as to maintain the armament hockey coating for longer time. But that was enough to hit Enel. Even Ken, who was just listening to the fight, did a double take. The character progression of Luffy had just gone up by 0.5%, and this was enough to give him sufficient boost and more strength. Enel, who was surprised by the first attack, didn't expect the consequent attack from Sanji. 
His mantra failed at that point. But Enel wasn't done with this. He went into his most potent and threatening mode. 200,000 volt Amaru, 200 million volts Thunder God. His body grew to become a huge, pot-bellied, Raijin-like lightning figure, morphing his body into pure 200,000 volts of electricity. Luffy and Sanji had a change of expression, but didn't back down at all. They proceeded to run towards Enel blindly, and Enel too was angry, as he was just beaten down from a weapon. He felt the same power as that guy who showed him fear, and he wanted to take revenge now. Enel knew that this guy wasn't as powerful in the other hockey as the other guy, and thus he wanted to take all his anger out on these two guys. Enel and the duo clashed multiple times after this, Luffy was swinging Enma and Sanji was flying around and trying to hit Enel while he was being occupied with Luffy. Enel's lightning had no effect on Luffy, and thus, Enel could only use his golden trident to match against him. Thus, Enel was more occupied with him, rather Sanji, who he could defend against, just be discharging. The clash went on for a few more minutes until Luffy was able to hit at Enel again with his armament hockey-laden punch while Enel was being distracted by Enma. This time, Enel was hit hard on his face and was thrown a few more meters back. His face had swollen by a great degree, and he cough up blood. The previous hit on his abdomen by Luffy, when he was in super rage, had broken some of his bones in the rib cage, and finally, his body was catching up with him. Sanji and Luffy didn't bother to give him a chance and proceeded to maul him together. But they miscalculated. Enel might be hurt, but he still had his lightning powers in full swing. He proceeded to call upon God's judgment upon the duo. Luffy, of course, was not hurt, but Sanji wasn't able to dodge in time and was struck by lightning. He saw white light in front of his eyes and knew that he would be hit and was just ready to let go and have faith in his captain. But before the lightning could hit his body, Sanji was forcefully shoved away by something. He was pushed by Ken himself, who had just appeared out of nowhere. Ken, you are here. Help me take down this guy. Luffy was super happy seeing his brother was back. He had been waiting for him some time now. He was sure that with his brother Ken it would be an easy match. Ken's main power was also based on lightning, so it would easier. Ken didn't respond to Luffy, but went to see if Sanji and Zoro were any good. Zoro was able to regain consciousness, but his hair was still yellow, but not as yellow as Zenitsu. There was a tinge of green color in his hair. Robin and others looked at Ken with a little bit of dread as Robin's words rang on the heads of others. Though Robin predicted that it might be because he was trying to help the crew, but the main topic of him insinuating this guy remained. Tam sorry, Zoro. I didn't expect your hair to turn yellow like Zenitsu, Ken said. Cough, it's fine. It was this guy who did it, not you. Zoro replied under his cough. He was still under bandage. No, Robin is right. It was me who had sent Enel to hunt you three. Ken replied while he looked at Robin. Read 50 chapters ahead on my patreon.com slash the lighted ghost. Chapter 167. The Fear and the Truth. Luffy didn't immediately ask for an explanation or started screaming like he usually does, but looked deep into the eyes of Ken. Luffy's big cross eyes seemed to be trying to look deep into Ken. Ken had forgotten how creepy sometimes the eyes of Jin Mori could be, Ken changed his eyes of Sharingan to get away from this creepiness, but he knew that Luffy wanted answers. He had already stopped fighting, and NL2 backed away, almost like escaping the eyes of Ken, which seemed to be filled with fear. That to do this, because I didn't see any other way out of the current predicament, Ken said. Sanji seemed to be lost in his anger and kicked Ken at his face. Ken deliberately didn't avoid the attack and took it in his face like a champ. He was thrown a few meters back but didn't fall in the ground. His body was too tough to be affected by Sanji's half-hearted kick. You have some guts to come to us after hurting our friends. Sanji said as he puffed up his smoke in anger. Sanji was ready to kick Ken again but was stopped by Luffy himself who had been silent. He was still looking for answers of why his own brother would send someone so powerful after them and had almost killed one of their own friends. Tam, sorry, Captain. I had to do this because we have grown way too faster and didn't receive any setback. All our fight until now had been easy, and we have become slack. 
If we continue like this, we will be decimated before we can reach the new world. I sent him to show you the difference between us and them. This guy doesn't even have armament hockey and was almost able to wipe the floor with you three, Ken said. His words rang like an alarm in front of the three. Zoro had slowly gotten up on his feet after Chopper bandaged him up. The three hung their head in shame. Ken was right. Enel was able to take on three with only his loggia fruit and observation hockey. Though he had taken some hit from Luffy and Sanji, but this wasn't enough. His raw power overwhelmed everyone, and they didn't have the proper answer to his power. Since Mihawk, this was the first time Zoro was taken down. Ken had been trying warn them, but except for Zoro, it fell into deaf ears for everyone. Sanji and Luffy were only good because their character had been progressing, not that they had been practicing on their powers. But you could have said this in a much friendlier way. We don't hurt out friends. It was Usopp who came and defended Luffy and Sanji who got silent when Ken spoke his mind. Talk in a friendlier way? Leaves won't care for emotions. Once we die, no act of kindness will bring us back. Do you think all of this is a game? People die in this journey. Since Captain Roger, there hasn't been anyone who had reached the laugh tale. Just think of the chances we have. Ken said. Again, reminding that this journey was all fun, but it wouldn't be so in the long run. Luffy slowly walked forward and Ken half-heartedly was ready to be reprimanded or get beaten by his captain. But surprisingly, he came and hugged Ken. Ken's stiff shoulders loosened up a bit as he saw his own brother in this way. All these years, he was the outlier of the four. He always felt himself a secondary character in the story. He never felt himself as the protagonist of the story, because he always believed that being the main character would lead to his death, even after having an awesome cheat. And thus, from the beginning, when he was placed under the care of Dadan, he had thought out of the plan of attaching himself to the leg of Luffy. He wanted to be as obscure as possible until he was powerful enough. Now that he was, he still felt a little awkward in front of others. It was always Luffy who had made him feel welcome. Even now, after the small betrayal he was hugged by Luffy, it was the same with Nami and even Sanji in the future where he betrayed them after the Dress Rosa arc. He accepted everything because deep down he knew that his friends were for his life and even trusted Jimbe with all the baggage he came along in the beginning. Ken proceeded to hug Luffy tighter, and he almost had tears in his eyes thinking of his past. He was grateful for this new life and his own brother who never saw him like an outsider. Tam, sorry for making you worried about us. We promise that we will work hard and be more powerful. Luffy said softly in his ears. But his words were heard by everyone. This brought a smile in the face of everyone. Everybody came together to give a group hug. Even Robin, who always refrained from human touch, wrapped her arms around. Meanwhile, Enel had flown away and almost vanished from their sight. He didn't want to get beaten by Ken again. Of course, Ken noticed the escaping Enel and shouted, Come back right here. Enel's face got black and slowly came back with dropped shoulders. What do you want now? I have done everything you have asked me, Enel said with anger. You want to see land or in your words, Virth, right? Ken asked. Enel stiffened and nodded. He wanted to go to the fairy Virth, or in simple words, the moon. There is almost nothing in your dream place, but you will come across some robots and some ancient texts and come across some space pirates. You will able to rule the land easily. Enel was greatly surprised by this. He didn't expect that this enigmatic guy would know his end goal too. He wanted to ask more, but his ego stopped him. Ken didn't bother with him and just proceeded to have fun with his crew as they would make a banquet. Read 50 more chapters on my patreon.com slash the light ed ghost, DK. Chapter 168, Self-Reflection. To the surprise of Ken, Enel didn't ask for more information and released the people who had been toiling on making his legendary golden ship that could fly, the Maxim. Maybe Enel's ego was too high, and he didn't want to acknowledge Ken's words and thus left. Of course, Enel wanted to destroy the whole Angel Island before leaving, but seeing the eyes of Ken, he knew that the ship had sailed, and hurting any resident of any part of the Skype would only result in him getting beaten. He was still very salty about the fact that his lightning had no effect on the two brothers. Both Luffy and Ken were immune to it, 
and Enel wondered if the brothers were born as his nemesis. It was good that he didn't know of Ace, or else he would be more surprised to know that Ace was a level higher and could even eat the lightning and charge it for his own attack later. The lightning fire mode that Natsu used once he ate Laxus's lightning attack. After NL left, Nami called the previous god Ganfall and asked him to mediate between the two tribes that had been fighting for a long time. When Luffy, Zoro, and Sanji were fighting, people from both tribes witnessed the long-standing fight and how NL had stepped down. By that time, both of the higher levels of the tribes got to know the power of the outsiders. So in fear, both of the tribes came forward. You both will accept a truce and not fight anymore. Ken didn't bother providing any sugar-coated words and gave his final verdict. Of course, the tribe of the actual Jaya Island was very uncomfortable. It was there when Cricket came forward and spoke of his ancestry with Norland. The Jaya tribe was surprised when they learned this. They had read about the history of Kalgara and Norland and even seen some images. The Jaya tribe at the end accepted the truce and Ganfall had happy tears in his eyes. His lifelong goal had been achieved. Meanwhile, as Ken settled things on Skype, others were more interested in the surroundings, especially Robin, who chose to explore more. Zoro, you have the character of Yoriichi. It's time you act like him. He was someone who could unleash 1,500 moves in the shortest amount of time, and you still can't achieve half of that. Sometimes it's not about a single attack. You need to be more flexible. You are too emotional when you fight. You need to let go. Ken started giving advice after the fight. Zoro had made great progress on Inosuke and Zenitsu, but somehow he was lacking when it came to Yoriichi's character. It was probably because Yoriichi, when fighting, could let go of all his emotions and just deal with the enemy. This gave him a huge edge over his enemy, or, in his case, Muzan. Ken wanted to see if Zoro could progress in his character if he let go of his emotions while fighting. Zoro, of course, was intelligent enough to understand the words of Ken and thus accepted the advice and promised to be more serious when it came to the completion of Yoriichi. Sanji it's time you embrace your lineage and use the hysterical strength instead of avoiding it. What? What does it have to do with my lineage? Sanji was confused. You believe that you are a failed experiment. You are not. You are better than your brothers. It's time you use the power that has been hidden inside you, Ken said. T will never be like my brothers. Sanji was incensed and roared out. You believe that you will lose emotions like your brothers. But have you seen any change in your emotions after using fire? Ken asked. Ken was right. All this time, Sanji was holding back because he felt using more power would make him like his brothers. But now that he thought about it, nothing of the sort happened. But what if I turn into them in the future? Sanji was still scared of that. You won't. We will keep an eye on it. Release your potential. Apart from Luffy, you are the only one among us who has the greatest potential. Don't waste it. Have faith in yourself and us. Go all out. Ken said. Sanji puffed his smoke and just dazed himself while sta Anding. Ken turned to Luffy who had ended up sleeping while eating. Chopper was tending to him. Though he wasn't as injured as Zoro, he had lost a lot of stamina and had bruises in many places, especially when he was seared by hot gold on his arms. The scar seemed to have struck his hand permanently as Chopper bandaged him. Ken went and slapped Luffy to wake him up. Ah, Ken, he was having such a great dream about food. You broke it. Luffy seemed frustrated that he had been woken from his meat dream. Ken didn't care, and just out of nowhere, he brought out a long gray stick and placed it on Luffy's hands. Luffy, who had been dozing off, instantly became alert when he saw the long gray pole in his hand. He knew what it was. Rijingu, a Yoi or Nyoibo, one of the three sacred weapons of Jin Mori, or the Monkey King. This staff could clone itself and have massive alteration powers, which could be done in both size and weight. Its actual weight was 80,000 tons, and it was said that only the Monkey King would be able to pick it up. Luffy was ecstatic to hold the staff. He had been using Enma with more speed and efficiency, and now he had the ultimate weapon to use it with. Keep this. Practice with Enma. Ken only said those words and not a word more. Luffy didn't really need any improvement, he was doing fine by himself. Ken just hoped that with the Rui Jingu, 
he could be more powerful than he was now. Ken had a feeling that from now on their voyage wouldn't be as smooth as it had been. Read 50 more chapters on my patreon.com slash the light ghost. Chapter 169, The Man Who Sleeps at His Work. Ken decided to spend another day at the Skype before leaving. In the original story, they had to run away for fear that the people of Skypea would be angry at them for looting the gold. But here, the people of Skypea were happy that Luffy and his crew were able to bring peace. The Jaya tribe's people genuinely advocated peace after talking with Cricket. He managed to calm them down and said it would be better for both tribes. Of course, the previous hatred couldn't just be wiped away, and it would take generations to achieve proper peace, but at least this was the start. Meanwhile, Robin had returned after she got to see the other Poneglyph under the Golden Bell. She got to know about the Poseidon and how she would find it on Fishman Island. Of course, she also saw the writing beside it. Roger left the trail, saying that they would complete the history. This time, Robin wasn't as naive as she was in the original story. She had heard a lot about Roger from Ken and knew that someone named Odin helped Roger write those words. Seeing the written version made her more zealous about knowing the history. After having a grand banquet and taking gold items out of the stomach of the huge snake, they were ready to return to the sea. Well, not everybody was ready to go. Cricket and his two friends decided that they would be here for some time to settle the two tribes in peace. Nami had bright eyes when she saw all the gold. Though technically speaking, Vivi could make gold with her body, but that would take too much time, and the gold content here was enough to make their crew rich. Mary needed a huge repair, and they had decided to repair their ship on the next island. Ken pitched the idea that they needed a shipwright for their journey, and Luffy was quick to approve a new Nakama if they could find a decent one. After packing everything up, Ken proceeded to open the Bifrost again. This Mary was yet another makeover. This time, they didn't need someone to pull. They needed a break on their wheels, and thus, it was modeled by Usopp accordingly. He put a lever on the handle that could help the brake system. Ken had to admit that Usopp really had a very creative mind. They bid their goodbyes to Konis and some of the friends they had made in Skypey and set off on their way. Konis had been really helpful to them, so Vivi gifted her a portable solar charger and a music player that also had a mic. She could record her own music, and even music made by others, and listen to it. The sun would charge the player. She thought it was some kind of expensive thing, so she denied it at first. But Vivi said, a little bit of food in my stomach is enough to make these. Plus, making this gives me a lot of practice. Konis didn't know what to say and just thanked her. Nami also gave Konis a magical pouch where she could keep her things. She was overwhelmed, to say the least. The log pose had already been settled, and now they were on their way to the next island. Ken wondered if they would meet the foxy pirates. The problem of landing on a military base in the anime was out of the question, as he would never let that happen with the Bifrost under his control. The only problem were the foxy pirates. This was a classic example of someone who had great devil fruit but was just a useless nobody. Mary landed right on the blue sea without any hitch while coming down. Mary didn't suffer at all. After landing on the sea, the ship went on its way, following the log pose, but after going a few distances, the crew finally encountered the thing that Ken feared. The foxy pirate's Ken was almost on his way to decimate the ship and get along, but it was Luffy who got curious and wanted to see what the deal was with the ship. Luffy, you deal with them. Don't drag me in, Ken said. Ken, these are just pirates. Why are you running away from them? Luffy asked. You will know soon. Ken mumbled and decided to shut himself in under the deck and start practicing his hockey. Meanwhile, the Foxy and the Stay, Raw Hats communicated for the first time, and other crew members instantly understood why Ken wanted to get rid of them in the beginning. Due to Luffy's foolishness, they were dragged in to play a useless game with the Foxy Pirates. The whole game sequence went on for a whole day, and the Foxy Pirates only won once. These pirates weren't ready to handle the huge boost that Ken had provided them with different characters, and none of them stood a chance. Ken kept an eye on them, even though he was practicing diligently on his own. 
he also noticed the change in Zoro and Sanji in the competition. Zoro was more stoic while competing, and Sanji had actually started progressing in his character. Though it was just by a single percent, it was better than the 0.1% he used to do before. A single percent jump showed that Sanji was ready to let his past fears go. After winning the game, they again set sail. While leaving, Ken didn't bother to be merciful to them and blasted their big ship to pieces using the Almighty's push. After three days of voyage, they finally saw an island from afar. The crew was overjoyed to see the land again. Being on a ship for a long time was a boring job, especially for the women, so they were thankful to see land once again. But as they got closer, Ken had a very serious look on his face. His observation, Haki, had made him hear the sound of snores from a person on the island, and he knew who his guy was. Read 51 chapters ahead on mytreon.com slash the Ghost. Chapter 170, Aokiji Kuzan Oh, there are many people here, but why is there no harbor on this island? Usopp said. They didn't need to see with their own eyes to know the number of people on the approaching island. Sensing the people on the island, they were a little confused about why there was neither a harbor nor any houses. But it didn't really matter. After anchoring Mary, everybody got to the shore and started to gather necessities from the forest for their next journey. The crew noticed that a few people were peeking at them from afar while they collected some spices and some medicine from the forest with the help of Chopper. Though they found it odd, they didn't go and stop their behavior. After collecting the things, Luffy declared that he was hungry, and thus a banquet was needed to satisfy himself. Since the captain had said it, there was no refusing the order. Soon they set up the huge barbecue stall and started roasting the meat. While they were eating out of nowhere, a small child from the forest ran after them, followed by the scream of a woman. Jenny, no, don't. The small child didn't seem to mind the scream and ran up to the straw hats. Her eyes seemed like she was hungry, and Nami didn't hesitate to forward her two skewers. The child's eyes brightened, and she immediately put the meat in her mouth. Don't. It's too hot. Nami wanted to stop the child, but she was too hungry to even bother with the heat of the food. The woman who had screamed before came running for her child. She caught her and put her behind herself. Following that, many others came out of bushes and forests. Some held forks and sticks in their hands, while others just showed their fists. Usopp and others could sense that this was almost the whole population of the island. Oye oye, isn't this too many people? Are the pirates so bad that the whole island has come for us? But they look too malnourished, Chopper said. As a doctor, he could easily tell that the people here hadn't eaten for many days, or that whatever they had eaten wasn't enough to satisfy their bodily needs. People, we didn't come here to raid or kill anyone. Nami shouted while trying to be the peacemaker. Meanwhile, the child who was put aside gave a burp, signifying that she had loved what she had eaten. You are pirates. There are never good pirates. The mother of the child declared. So you're ready to pay taxes to the government that doesn't even care for you, but when it comes to the people who just gave your child some food, we become the bad ones? Ken spoke in a very calm tone. This. The woman didn't know how to refute that. They were traveling on a ship when they were hit by a huge frog, which led to the sinking of the ship. Somehow the people of the ship swam to the island and waited for help, but it never came. And now a pirate group showed up, and even provided food to one of their children. They didn't know what to make of it. Nami didn't want any more misunderstandings and said that they would provide food for everyone and even give them medicine. The people around were too hungry to even bother if they were being deceived or not, and thus they accepted the help. That woman, who was wary of the pirates and said they were only bad pirates, let go of her prejudice and ate what was served by Sanji and others. There is another guy on the island? Why isn't he with you? Luffy suddenly said this through a mouth filled with meat. You just ate. Why are you again eating with them? Usopp gave him a hit on the head. Hey, why didn't you bring the other man with you? We can feed him. Zoro asked, as he could see the other man was far away. The other man? Oh, you mean the mysterious man? You have seen him? You see, he didn't come with us. He just used a bicycle to come to the island. One of the estranged survivors said this while eating.
What? Haha, -ha. riding a bicycle in the sea? That is hilarious. No one can ride a bicycle in the sea. Tam sorry, but that was what everyone saw. Another man came in support. That is weird. Let us go and meet him. I want to know how one could ride a bicycle in the sea. Usopp said. Following his words, everyone went to meet this mysterious man. All this time, Ken has been exceptionally silent. He knew who this man was, and he was clearly able to hear his snore from afar. Soon the Straw Hat crew came to the place where the man was, and what they saw was a little inexplicable. They saw a tall nine-feet man, yes, he is that tall, standing in the open sun while wearing an eye pad over his eyes, like Luffy, and snoring quite loudly. Out of all the people in the Straw Hats, Robin, seeing the face, shuddered in her place and fell down. Robin, what happened? Robin, the tall man suddenly stopped snoring, removed his eye pad and opened his eyes with great difficulty to see what the ruckus was about. Ararara, look who is here, so many people. The man said, who are you? What did you do to Robin? Luffy was instantly furious and squeezed his fist to battle this tall guy. Robin, what happened? Tell us, Vivi asked as she held Robin. He is one of the best men in the Navy, one of the three admirals, Aokiji Kuzan. Robin said this while still shuddering in fear. Admiral? Such a high post? Nami and others were surprised that this sleepy man was one of the finest in the Navy. No, no, I didn't come with any official business. I was just passing by. Aokiji said this while slowly sitting down. He seemed to be tired after standing for a long time. Admiral? So he is an enemy. We need to beat him up. Luffy declared. Read 50 chapters ahead on my PRion.com slash the Lighted Ghost. Chapter 171. Who is the real threat? Can you please stop with that? I am you see. I... Aokiji stumbled upon his own words and stopped. Eh, it's too much for me to stand out here in the open sun. Let me lie down. Aokiji went from standing mode to sitting mode and was almost ready to sleep. Zoro and Sanji were incredibly irritated and were ready to beat him up until Chopper and Usopp came to stop them. Oh, so you are in the Navy? Why didn't you say so earlier? The stranded people who had been fed by the Straw Hats followed them inside and got to hear their conversation. They were relieved to know that this weird, tall man was from the Navy. Guys, don't listen to him. He is the Navy. Luffy, who already seemed to be suffering from high blood pressure, said, Yes, is that wrong? said one of the men. Ah, yes, yes, he is the Navy. We are the pirates. We are the bad guys. He is the good one. Ha ha. The others were speechless seeing the stupidity of their captain. Aokiji suddenly got up and said, You guys should pack up. Since you have eaten your fill, it's time I send you home. Aokiji said. Everyone was confused about what was going to happen. Was he going to pull the people to the next island? Aokiji just laughed at their speculation and reached the shore. He inserted his hand into the sea and murmured, Ice Age. What happened next blew the minds of the people. The sea, out of nowhere, froze. It took almost a blink of an eye to freeze the whole sea. Everywhere that the people around them could look was frozen. Even Ken, who knew what was going to happen, was a little dumbstruck. This is unbelievable. Amazing. The crew was again reminded how powerful some people were. A few days ago, they faced Inel. It was only because of cheats that they survived, and there was Ken. But somehow the crew felt that even with Ken, they would have a very hard time fighting this guy but it was a happy moment for the stranded men and women. The ice will be frozen for two weeks, and it is connected to the next island. If you go north, you will reach there in one week. Aokiji said, Thank you. Thank you so much. In no time, they were ready. The straw hats helped them pack the bags and food. Since it would be frozen, the food would remain in perfect condition. They were also thankful to the straw hats and slowly started their journey. Meanwhile, Chopper started having fun on the ice. Luffy, seeing this, also joined, and so did Usopp. But due to the cold, they had to return to the shore, where they saw Aokiji looking at Luffy and Ken with keen eyes. What? Luffy, getting the glare, asked. What should I say? You remind me of your grandpa. He was quite a menace to me when I was in training, Aokiji said. Grandpa, he means hero garp? Vivi whispered and asked. Nami nodded. What do you want? T actually came to know that Nico Robin had disappeared from Alabasta. I suspected that she had come with you. What I didn't expect was that even the Princess of Alabasta had run with you. 
You guys are more dangerous than you seem to be. So what? Vivi and Robin joined us of their own accord. They are happy with us. Luffy slapped back with his statement. Though the government isn't really concerned about you, it can be seen that you guys are more dangerous than you seem to be, Aokiji said. So what are you going to do about it? Ken asked, finally opening his mouth. He had been silent all this time, but now he seemed to be back to his normal self. It was fine if there were only you and others, but Nico Robinsu, she is a danger to the Navy and the world government, Aokiji said. The surrounding area started dropping as ice started slowly forming around his body. Robin felt her knees weak. Everyone in the crew started getting serious. Ken looked at him and said, T refuse. I say you are more dangerous to the Navy than we are. Ken, out of nowhere, dropped a very absurd statement. The statement was so weird that even the crew looked at Ken as if he had become an idiot like his brother. Ken, R, you okay? Nami asked. T am fine. Why? You don't believe me? Ken asked as he looked at Aokiji. He just looked at Ken as if he were some kind of idiot. Then let me break it down for you and ask you a question. How much longer do you think Fleet Admiral Sengoku will remain in his position? Eh? Now Aokiji was confused, as he couldn't understand why Ken had brought his superior up in the conversation. Why? Can't answer? If everything goes well, at best, one or two years. He is getting old. So a new Fleet Admiral will be required to step up. Kizaru won't step up because he can only bully the weak and fear the strong, or maybe he is just a lackey of the world government. That leaves you and Akainu. So tell me, Aokiji Kuzan, are you okay with Akainu sitting at the top? Ken spoke in one stretch. Aokiji was first a bit furious about how Ken degraded Kizaru, one of his comrades, but the words spoken at the end made Aokiji do a double take. He hadn't thought so far into the future, but this guy out of nowhere laid the secrets bare for the Navy in just a few words. He had always known that Sengoku wanted him to be the next fleet admiral, but his other colleague would definitely not let him be that easily. But he didn't understand how Ken pointed him out as a threat to the Navy. Read 50 chapters on my patreon.com slash thelightedhost.